Yeah, good morning. I just wanted to take a, a few minutes to highlight uh, in, in a little bit deeper detail the advantages of access that are provided to us as an investigator community for the ISS National Lab. As Greg mentioned, the International Space Station National Lab is a unique opportunity, and it's also a, a platform for innovation in the space environment that enables our imaginations uh, to explore a brand new laboratory environment. And I wanted to highlight just a few of the, the recent projects that have been green, light, green lighted and awarded at CASIS moving forward to present to you the diversity of areas of research and technology development that now have access to this environment and are starting to reap those benefits. And I wanted to emphasize that, you know, as an organization, we are very privileged to be the managers of the International Space Station and our ability in that role to engage with a very diverse community. So there are project opportunities that enable access to the ISS National Lab that are not only funded by the commercial sector directly because of the benefit they have there, but also through funding provided by government agencies in addition to NASA. So while NASA continues to actively utilize and fund research and technology development utilizing the International Space Station to address concerns related to the journey to Mars, there are opportunities, funding opportunities, sponsored programs that are enabled by access to grant opportunities from institutions such as the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. And I wanted to highlight, first of all, I, I hope all of you were, were able to, to see yesterday's press release from the National Center of Advancing Translational Sciences. We have representatives from NIH here today who will be participating in a panel later, and they'll be available to address questions there. And that particular opportunity addresses cutting edge science and platform development that's focused on the utilization of platforms that can replicate the function of whole tissues or whole human organs based on technology advancements funded previously by the National Institutes of Health and DARPA. So what we're seeing as an organization at CASIS is the translation of these investments in research for national applications who are seeing the value in space as a test platform. And again, the only limit to having access to that environment is the limits of our imaginations. So with that, I'd like to first call out AxoSim Technologies. We're fortunate to have Michael Moore and Lowry Curley here in the audience sitting up front. They have a, an opportunity uh, to develop, continue to develop their technology, which is focused on nerve on a chip. So as you may be aware, there are a variety of health issues that, are, that uh, have at their root cause issues with demyelination of nerve tissue. And one of the uh, potential avenues for really blowing this type of research out of the water and taking what, it, what will be a, a revolutionary rather than an evolutionary step is the develop of technologies for recreating nerves on chips so that you have the ability to have much higher throughput with much less resource investment and having to use a whole organism. So you have the ability there to utilize these organ on chip technologies for testing drug efficacy, for understanding the benefits and detriments of particular drugs without having to utilize the whole organism. And you have that significant added advantage of being able to use human cells rather than other species going forward. We also have an opportunity coming forward with Visidine Incorporated. So again, to highlight the diversity of uses for the International Space Station, Visidine is developing tropical cyclone intensity measurements. So in addition to access to the microgravity environment on board the International Space Station, companies and technology developers have the opportunity to utilize it as an observational platform. And that use as an observational platform ranges from the ability to use it as a launch point for small satellites and microsatellites to the testing of materials or subcomponents involved in the manufacture of those, those microsatellites so that there is access to the external environment on board the International Space Station. And there's access to the International Space Station as an observation point looking back towards Earth as well as deep into space. Along those lines of, of interest in utilization of the International Space Station for manufacturing initiatives, understanding not only about the degradation of materials and polymers in that environment, there is interest in exploiting low Earth orbit in the future as a manufacturing platform. 
Right now, many of those investigations are focused on understanding the fundamental physical properties of manufacturing in that environment. But there are opportunities as we go forward where we may actually discover that the price point of access to low Earth orbit is low enough through a commercial marketplace that companies actually begin to look at it as a manufacturing platform. One of those who's moving in that direction is Fiber Optics Manufacturing and Space, Farms Incorporated, who is seeking to work with for the development of Z-Blan optical fibers in that environment. Because in the absence of gravity and, and buoyancy-driven convection, there are opportunities to understand at a fundamental physical level ways to improve the manufacturing process that give you an end product with improved characteristics for that market. I would also like to announce, getting back into the life sciences side, we uh, have announced an award with Dr. Robert Schwartz at University of Houston, who is developing a bioreactor system that can enable the conversion of adipogenic mesenchymal stem cells, stem cells into mature cardiac cells. So again, you have the possibility of utilizing the International Space Station National Lab as a platform that supports not only fundamental discovery, but translational medical research, where you can actually exploit the influence of microgravity on the proliferation and differentiation of stem cells that will in time lend itself to organ replacement and tissue repair for biomedical regeneration, an area of very active research that's also currently supported by the National Institutes of Health and other agencies. Along those lines, we've also recently announced an award to Dr. Alessandro Grattoni at Houston Methodist Research Institute who is working in collaboration with a pharmaceutical company to develop implantable nano-channel nano systems for controlled delivery of therapeutic drugs. This is an exciting new advance in that one of the limitations of drug delivery systems that we currently have are that they are very dose dependent. So there's often an immediate release of the drug and then a sharp decline over time. And that influences the efficacy, the kinetic efficiency of those types of drugs. The microfluidic systems and nanofluidic channel systems are sophisticated enough now so that both implantable devices and wearable devices, as you heard yesterday, can not only monitor health status but can actually respond to that health status and afford a new level of control with drug delivery. So this investigation that involves a, a drug in development by Novartis and demonstration of a technology, a nanochannel system developed in, by Dr. Grattoni's lab, is an exciting Inter, inter, uh, intercommunication between both the translational drug delivery part and understanding the efficacy of a drug that can be used not only for human health, but also advance the utilization of animal models, including rodents, in the spaceflight environment. And I'd like to close with a, a, another opportunity for manufacturing in space. Uh, our colleagues from Made in Space are here and will also be presenting at, at a plenary later. And in addition to their ability currently to support additive manufacturing in space, so there's now a, a direct commercial avenue to utilization of the ISS National Lab for the fabrication of materials in space using a variety of different feedstocks. There's also an opportunity for Made in Space to do a, a demonstration project looking at the utilization of that platform again for optical fiber manufacturing. So again, there are a diversity of topics related to engineering development, to enabling technologies, to health sciences that can benefit from this platform. And we're very excited at CASIS to be able to bring those forward to you. And remember that, please remember that most importantly, the only limiting factor to getting your science, your technology development up to station is your imaginations. So come to us, talk to us, let's explore new options, new opportunities both with funding from CASIS as well as other organizations. And with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the next session. Mr. Frank Mooring, I think, is known to everyone here in the audience. He's a senior editor at Aviation Week in Space Technology. He's been a journalist for over 40 years, specializing in aerospace for over 20 years. Frank joined Aviation Week in 1989 as a defense and space reporter and senior space technology editor. He began his career working for his hometown daily in Huntsville, Alabama, and moved to Washington in 1979 as a correspondent for the Birmingham Post-Herald. He later covered the Cold War Pentagon for Scripps Howard News Service, and we're very fortunate to have him here today to moderate our keynote this morning. Frank, please come to the stage.
It's nice to be here today. It's also a little bit hard to believe that we're talking about manufacturing in space. Um, when I started covering NASA back in 91, the space station was just a, uh, a plan, a concept, or a big political fight. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's come a long way, obviously. And uh, of course, to get to the space, sta space station, you have to fly in a rocket. And we have a couple of guys here who uh, can get you there with their rockets. And so I'm just going to introduce them briefly. The way we'll do it, they'll, they'll make some uh, brief presentations. And um, hopefully that will raise questions in your minds. I think there's some microphone runners in the room. So or I see they're on stanchions. So we'll, uh, we will uh, hopefully have a conversation. I have a few questions, but our uh, our panelists are here. First one is Tori, uh, Salvador T. Torrey Bruno. He's the president and CEO of United Launch Alliance, and ULA operates the Atlas V and Delta IV right now. And before joining ULA, he served as vice president and general manager at Lockheed Martin Strategic and Missile Defense Systems. He holds several patents and is the author of two books, and we just discussed those a little bit. They have to do with medieval history, so he's a renaissance man, or a medieval <laughs> renaissance man. You never know. And um, to Tori's uh, left is Frank Culbertson, Jr. He's the president of Orbital ATK Space Systems Group. He's been in this business a long time. He's a former NASA astronaut who flew in space three times for a total of more than 144 days in orbit, and 125 of them were on the, the space station in its early incarnation. He was the commander of Expedition 3, and as such, he witnessed the September 11 attacks from, from, from orbit. He was, I believe, the only American off the planet that day. And he's a retired Navy captain, and before there was a space station, he was program manager at NASA for the Shuttle Mir program. So he's got a lot of experience in this area. And with that, I think I'll sit down, let them make their presentations. I think Tori will go first, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Frank. I think we have a video clip, if we can run that. Three, we have ignition. If you haven't guessed, I just love rockets, and I, and I never get tired of watching a video like that. The more fire and the more smoke, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I'll tell you, it, uh, it's really exciting to be here with you and to be in this human endeavor at this moment in time. The previous speaker said a lot of really exciting things, if you think about it. You know, NASA has shown us, with its tremendous foundational work all this time now, that we can live and work in space, and the research that's been done is now showing us that there's actually economic potential there as well. There could be businesses in space, which is ultimately the path to our human destiny beyond this planet. 
we have seen that there is a potential for microgravity manufacturing, microgravity research, areas we haven't even thought of yet, maybe even space tourism. And so I'm very, very excited that at this moment in time, in this very conference that we're at here today, that we are standing on the very beginning of an opportunity to realize that vision. And certainly in the not so distant future, really the near term, to see what is essentially a research and industrial park in space with regular ferry service back and forth for our goods and people and to really begin this, this exciting journey. And I'm very, very happy to be here this morning with you to talk about all of that. So good morning. Frank? Thank you very much, Frank, and thank you, Tori. Um, thank you for the invitation to participate in this conference again. Uh, it's always a privilege to be here. Um, we are proud partners with Tory in a number of endeavors and his company and proud partners with many of you all. And that's what it takes in this business is to have a team that can, can pull this off because it's not easy as we've all seen. Uh, it's going to take persistence, it's going to take creativity, it's going to take innovation, and it's going to take a lot of courage both on a business side and on a human side to continue this endeavor on Space Station. And Space Station is the cornerstone of human exploration. We have to keep it going. I'd like to show a short video right now to give you an update on what we're doing in orbital ATK, uh, particularly our Cygnus spacecraft that provides cargo delivery to the space station. So we could roll the video and I'll talk over it. I don't have the same exciting music that Tori does. <laughs> was our most recent mission to the International Space Station and we just finished a couple of weeks ago. Um, this uh, mission had some innovations that were new over the last two missions including our new solar arrays uh, Ultraflex which are uh, built right out here in California. Uh, provide us with more efficient power and, and lighter weight solar arrays. Uh, the processing of the, of the spacecraft itself of course is like any spacecraft done very carefully. Uh, loading uh, approximately three tons of cargo into the uh, into the uh, pressurized cargo module uh, takes a few, couple of weeks and uh, there's two phases of it an early load and a late load and sometimes even a third phase uh, we have to of course integrate the uh, cargo module with the service module itself which is a, a, again a very precise and, and uh, careful task that we have to achieve and then we're integrated with the uh, with the launch vehicle in this case of OA6 it was with the Atlas V a great effort over a very short period of time by the, by the Orbital ATK and ULA teams to bring that together after our mishap at, at Wallops uh, in 2014. So um, uh, we are very, very proud of the fact that we were able to get back to flight so quickly and to turn around two missions in about three months. Um, the uh, first one took a few days for weather, wasn't your fault. Uh, the second one went right on time and uh, it was a very proud day for all of us to get that uh, spacecraft on orbit see the solar arrays unfurl and, uh, and then to press on with the mission. Uh, we were on the space station uh, pro over 60 days, I think over 70 days actually, uh, delivered the cargo, departed with uh, almost two tons of cargo for disposal and also carried uh, uh, payloads that were uh, essentially hosted payloads, uh, ride-alongs uh, that were conducted post unberthing uh, so that we could continue research even after we had departed the station. Uh, the, one of the most exciting parts about it, of course, is providing uh, the, what the crew needs up there so that they can continue their missions. Uh, once we departed, uh, we executed what was called the uh, Sapphire mission, uh, or Sapphire experiment, rather, which was a, a combustion experiment to, uh, to, on a larger scale, see how fire propagates in zero-g in a, uh, a space station environment. And then there was a, also a deployment of some CubeSats, and then a, a uh, uh, experiment to look at the re-entry itself, both internally and externally, as we re-entered the atmosphere and, and uh, hopefully burned up all the cargo. Um, these hosted payloads, we think, are the future for this type of, of operation. It's a commercial endeavor. Uh, it's a partnership with both the government and with industry. And uh, it's a way to, to really maximize the use of these vehicles once they finish their, their main task of delivering cargo to the space station. Um, as I said, the station is the cornerstone of what we're going to do in the future. It has to keep going. I know the official target date for completion of the mission is 2024. 
I think that's about 25 years too short. But uh, uh, I do think space station needs to continue for as long as it's viable. I think we need to continue both the government research, the cases, and uh, national lab sponsored research, encourage more people to come up there because you all are the way we're going to be able to live in space. What you're doing in your research and development and encouraging people to stretch the boundaries and push the limits of what we can do in space and also find ways for us to, to more safely and efficiently live in space is really the key. And if we're gonna go back to the moon, if we're gonna go to Mars, we've gotta have a, a working space station. And uh, I'm really worried that if we ever, ever stop sending people to the space station, stop sending supplies, it's gonna take a generation or two to get back get that foothold back in space. We have the high ground now. Other company, countries want to be a part of that. Others actually want to lead that in place of us. We need to maintain what we're doing and you all really are the key to that. So please keep being innovative, keep pushing the boundaries and keep bringing your ideas and keep sending your hardware to the space station because we need it <laughs> as a business. And if we want to be able to, to keep supplying the crew, we have to have a viable business. And I want to see commercial endeavors come to the station as tenants, almost like uh, shop, shops in a, in a mini mall where you, you open a new business, you prove it out, and then you go off on your own. I really think that the space station itself has got to be the foundation of that. And the government and industry and commercial entrepreneurs need to be able to continue to work together to expand that type of an envelope. I'll be happy to answer more questions, and I can expound on this for a couple of hours, Frank, if you want me to. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have a saying in journalism, I would, have, I would have written a shorter story if I'd had more time. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> after yesterday, I, I, I need a lot more time to, yeah. to write a story that'll fit in our magazine. But let me, let me start with you and just on, on the point that you just made about the station being a foothold in, uh, in space. Sometimes it's also referred to as a stepping stone. And, right. and the, the mission that you did with, with NASA Glenn and the, and the combustion experiment, Sapphire, I think maybe was a a first step even off the station into what you've both said could be a, a, an economy off the planet in low earth orbit and eventually beyond. Could you tell us where you're planning to go with Cygnus in uh, LEO um, and what other types of, of, of uh, hosted payloads missions that you foresee using that asset um, to the fullest extent before it re-enters. Well, being an industry now rather than the government, I'll say we'll go where the business takes us. Mm. We'll, we will put as many capabilities in the spacecraft and in the system as we can to support whatever needs we see out there. And the more ideas we get from people, the better we can, better job we can do of that. Uh, but we do think there is a potential business for that, for not just at the station, but away from the station. Uh, our Cygnus could probably fly easily for a year uh, after unberthing from the space station, conducting experiments of various types. Um, we've got a good relationship with NASA in terms of being able to carry what they need and then keep a little bit of capability and resources for others to, uh, to conduct their experiments, whether it's government or commercial. But I can easily see that. Um, there's not many people in the room as old as me, but some of you may remember uh, Space Industries back in the 1980s, uh, Max Faget and Joe Allen and their idea of actually establishing an independent module that looks a lot like mm. Cygnus in the pictures, uh, where you could man tend it and, and, and actually conduct experiments and come and go. And I think there's still a potential for that in, in low Earth orbit. I guess one of the attractions for that would be the, the really low uh, accelerations right. on the yeah, free you get, flyer. You get true microgravity if you don't have you know, us people moving around and bumping up there. That's good. So there's something to be thinking about for the scientists in the room, ways to use that, that space. And um, again, I don't see, I don't think I see anybody at the microphones. If they are, or just. They're pretty shy. Yeah. Well, you know, Mike, um, in his introduction, mentioned price points and um, that it's getting to the point where, where that would support um, not just specialized research, but perhaps even manufacturing of some, some materials and, and so forth. Um, Tori, you're, you're um, moving away from the, the vehicles that you're using now. We talked a little bit about changes at the factory down in Alabama. Um, describe how the changes that you're um, contemplating with the new Vulcan rocket will affect that price point for getting Oh, sure. uh, manufacturing equipment to, to space. And I'll, and I'll also ask Frank that as well when you're done. Yeah. 
Well, as we move forward into that platform, we're, we're really going to see the, uh, you know, the, the price of lift collapse by more than half. And just as important and related to what allows you to do that is the time it takes to build the rocket, integrate the rocket at the pad, and go to space has already been cut in half. And you'll see us talk later in the year. I don't want to jump the gun on our announcements, but we're going to change the way people are able to buy their lift to space and shorten dramatically the lead times that they have to put into their business model in order to say, okay, I'm going to need to go ahead and have a launch service. All of that comes together because what we really want to look at when we see this problem is, is not just a price point for this or a price point for that, but a bigger picture of an economic environment that's going to exist in LEO. And so I, I think the vision is really what, what Frank was, was alluding to in his remarks a moment ago. You know, if we're going to do this, we sort of need, you know, we need three things. We need an industrial park in space. Uh, we need a regular ferry service going back and forth, transportation. And we need an anchor tenant. And I can see the space station as the center of that industrial park with private modules added to it to increase the real estate and probably free flyers as well in a very nearby orbit. And, uh, you know, I'd love to be the ferry service back and forth as well as others with an anchor tenant. And NASA can be that anchor tenant. And that is really what Frank was talking about a moment ago, where if we add real estate in space, you know, NASA would perhaps lease some of that real estate, but not all of it, because we want a business model where that anchor tenant is there, but we have additional capacity to lease and rent and sell to other people, and the same on the transportation side. And you want to think of it economically, because it's absolutely no different than an industrial park here on Earth. It's exactly the same thing. You bring that anchor tenant in because they cover uh, the fixed costs associated with moving that, and they greatly reduce the risk that uh, the investor who develops that real estate is going to be able to at least break even and not lose their shirt, and then they can lean forward and feel confident that they can go out and sell the rest of the capacity. Same on the ferry service, same on that train or highway to space. And that would become a primary mission among the other exploration missions for NASA to see themselves as stimulating this economy by providing that, uh, that facilitization to allow industry to move out into space. And then over time, you know, NASA's uh, role will be eclipsed by private industry. And they will be free to move out, you know, deeper into the solar system, which is the plan. Right. The, uh, there are some good examples on Earth here of just that scenario. And those of you familiar with Stennis Space Center and Kennedy Space Center, I think you can see how they are actually bringing tenants in from other government agencies as well as from industry to use that land and also to get the synergy between the technology that's been developed there and the, that's going on. Station can be a similar situation where the government is initially the, the owner of the, the base, but then moves on. Uh, there's a good example from uh, my home state of South Carolina. There were a couple of Air Force bases that are there when I was growing up that are now industrial parks because people gradually moved in and the Air Force moved out. And I think you'll see that over the next couple of decades in space as people continue to, to build out and establish businesses. We have to have commercialization. We have to have the business or we can't justify continuing to go. Whenever new lands were settled here on Earth, there had to be some industry that enticed people to come and that kept the economy going, such as fur trade or agriculture or tobacco or whatever it was. Uh, without that, people aren't going to go there. Same thing is true of space. We need you all to come up with the businesses that are going to sustain this operation and, and increase the frequency of doing these very difficult operations. You know, flying used to be very unique 100-something years ago. A, a, a rocket launch should not be as unique as it is now 50 years from now. It should be just a routine thing, just like in science fiction. And if you look at what people are planning right now, it may be a lot sooner than 50 years before we see a rocket launch uh, every couple of days going somewhere and, and people going into space and payloads going into space. We really need that if we're going to turn it into an economic, uh, an economic zone. And, but without that, it's going to be very difficult to, to go beyond low Earth orbit, which has to be our ultimate goal, to get away from space, or from Earth, I mean.
Thanks, Frank. I think I see somebody at the microphone. Yeah, uh, Mary Beth Adine, I'm the manager of the research office in the space station program. Um, we've really been struggling with um, how you make this transition, right? Um, at this point, the government is in between the supply side and the demand side. Um, everything, uh, you know, we end up doing Space Act agreements with, with a lot of our customers here in order to basically give them a, a, a lease or, or a, a spot on station and they need that piece of paper that has a government signature because that helps them with investing and everything else. But at some point, supply side and demand side have to be working without the government as a go-between. How do you guys see, what, what are the steps we need to take? How do, how do we need to make that transition so that instead of us putting something on a contract to enable these, these uh, you know, post-undoc post missions or something like that, they just go straight to you guys and have that conversation and they buy that service without, without having to go through the government? Do you want to start? I think that's a, that's a really big question, Mary Beth, because we still have human spaceflight requirements we have to satisfy if you're going to go anywhere near the station. And, and I don't know how at this particular point you shortcut that or, or reduce it. I mean, you can reduce the bureaucracy, and I think the station program has been working very hard to do that and to make it more user-friendly, but you still have standards and laws, really, that you have to comply with. Um, we can be the go-between for arranging for what's going to go to the station. Tory's company can be the go-between for arranging the launches and being the broker for that. But if you're going to go to the station, there are still certain standards we have to meet. And maybe having um, uh, an expansion of the office or, the, or an evolution of the office that you have now doing it to make it more streamlined and, and to um, make the checklist simpler might be the way to, to make it easier for the brokers in between. So I, the only thing I would add to that, because that was right on, is you know, it would be terrific if we had a consistent model so that uh, a lot of these uh, decisions and requirements, if you will, are sort of in place and, and these entities that would come to us to put together a business to go to space and do some activity there it would be a little bit more turnkey mm -hmm. and, and a little bit more consistent. That would significantly shorten the time and improve everybody's business case. And NASA plays a role. You guys control that and you could work together with industry to put that framework in place. Tori, you mentioned um, cutting the price of, of access to space by half. Uh, I know in your long-term plan for Vulcan, there's some some thought of reusability. There's other there are other people yes. working in that area as well. Can you describe um, how that technology is and will develop is developing and will develop, and how that will affect the price? Is it just it it may be counterintuitive? I think how it how it would sure. actually work. Yeah, what a great question. Uh, I think you're really referring to when we uh, continue on to the Vulcan Aces configuration and introduce our new upper stage. That will be a revolution in how we go to space and what we can do there. Um, you know, today we operate the longest duration upper stages in the world. Uh, the Centaur and the Delta upper stage are cryogenic high energy stages. They can go to very difficult orbits and complex orbits that. Uh, you can't do without those types of propellants because of their long duration, you know, and it's just so impressive that they operate seven, eight hours, three, four, five burns, isn't that amazing? ASIS is going to operate 20 times longer than that with an indefinite number of burns. And because of that ultra long duration, it will be inherently uh, able to be refueled in space and its mission duration could go on indefinitely. And so although you know, we're a transportation company and we, you know, our, our history has been, you know, Earth to a destination orbit and then we're done. In this technology, we will not need to bring these upper stages ever back down. There's no reason to bring them back down. They'll stay in space and be available to do other transportation missions there. This will have a whole host of implications for how we go there. I mean, there will come a time, I think, when we rarely lift from the surface of the Earth beyond LEO. Because there'll be a fleet of ACES up there, there'd be no reason not to have one of them swoop down, pick it up, and take it the rest of the way. That will significantly increase the size and complexity of what we can get there. You know, sort of imagine, 
you know, a space telescope so gigantic that we can just barely get it to LEO. That's two-thirds of anywhere to anywhere in the solar system. And then ACES could come down and take it out. Imagine what we could get off, you know, a Hubble future descendant that's got a telescope ten times as big. And so that, uh, that's that model. It enables distributed lift uh, where we can take up, you know, the object in two missions. Uh, it allows us to mechanically, meaningfully interact with spacecraft after they've been brought to space because of this very long mission duration. So these are going to fundamentally change what we have there, and that's essential to this future we imagine. You know, we're going to need, when all this industrial activity is going on in LEO and beyond, uh, in addition to the, you know, to the big train and big, you know, freight ship that got us to space, we're going to need some... Uh, box trucks and pickup trucks moving things around between destinations, that upper stage will make all of that possible. Even in, a, in the context of a traditional expendable launch vehicle, the way we use them today, it's a significant cost improvement. Because of its tremendous performance, we're able to take solids off of our rocket. We're able to eventually replace our three core Delta Heavy currently the largest rocket flying in the world. It's essentially three rockets bolted together. It's a thing to behold. But it's also expensive because it's three rockets <laughs> bolted together. This new configuration replaces that. We'll be able to do a Delta mission for a small fraction of that Delta heavy cost. So your approach to reusability would, would come in the upper stage initially. You've talked about yes. recovering those engines as well from we'll the first do that stage. Too. Well, you know, we, uh, we're also looking at, at uh, recovering our first stage engine. So, you know, rules of thumb to give you a feel for it. You know, half, half the launch service is the rocket, half the rocket's the first stage, or either stage, and two-thirds of that stage is actually the engines. The tanks are not very expensive. It's really all in the engine. And so our concept involves recovering the engine and bringing it back to Earth in a more benign environment than it experienced on the way up and quickly reusing it. And the exciting thing about this moment in our industry is that lots of people are working on this very self-same problem of reusability and they're trying different approaches and that's how you get innovation. You know, I think a lot of people imagine that innovation comes from just one person somewhere happening to have the light bulb go off over above their head. Oh, that's it. That's the brilliant, you know, idea, and then everybody jumps on it. That, you know, that is not how it actually works. We get innovation, and we have lots of players trying all kinds of different and creative things, feeding off of each other in that energy and those discoveries, and then the marketplace in our capitalist system tells us what actually works. And right. so I'm pretty excited to be yeah, there now. I can tell. Yeah. Did you have? Yeah, look at some of the look at some of the early airplane designs from the 50s that aren't flying now. But but um, uh, we actually have uh, similar concepts and uh, some of which are complementary, some of which are alternative to what Tori has described. Um, we also see a need for, for spacecraft that stay in space for a long period of time. Uh, we are developing now the um, mission extension vehicle, MEV, that will allow commercial satellites to extend their missions uh, for five to ten years uh, when they've run out of fuel. And we should be flying that in a, in a couple of years. Um, our Cygnus spacecraft will be capable of uh, supporting modules that go to cis lunar and, and either providing alternative propulsion and power for the crew when they arrive, but certainly providing an outpost worth of food and, and cargo for them when they get there. And, um, and maybe as an alternative or a supplement to what you're talking about, a, a way to get back and forth between low Earth orbit and, and the moon. And, um, uh, but we're going to have to have that kind of a transportation system, and I agree with Tori. Uh, low Earth orbit should be an initial destination, but getting from low Earth orbit to everywhere else is an alternative technology, and it doesn't have to be all in one rocket like Apollo uh, or a sprint to Mars. I think it's going to have to be done in, in phases, just as we've done many explorations around the Earth. And, uh, uh, and I think we in industry uh, have a lot of good ideas, and I think uh, you all, in supporting us in the research and development community, can help move those along by helping us um, uh, both justify what we're doing as well as enable what we're doing. So thanks for your hard work on that. Thanks, Frank. I believe there are yes. some people lined up out there. Yes. Um, 
I'd like to get back to the question raised by Mary Beth Hedin. And I think it's an incredibly, the, the question of ISS evolution or transition or whatever you want to call it is incredibly important. And it's necessarily very complicated, I think, for two distinct reasons. One is the example of the gas can program. Everybody who wanted to fly a gas can experimented want, wanted to do something novel that was not envisioned by the program, okay? And it ended up collapsing the program. They, they had to transition in, into the hitchhiker problem uh, pr program that had similar hardware as an option but looser ground rules, okay? So the problem is when you're trying to do new stuff in space, what are going to turn out to be the real issues that have to be addressed is not easily addressed in advance by program structure. The second thing is that ISS evolution or transition or whatever can't be dealt with unless you deal, recognize, and shine a light on all aspects of the problem. And that's, you know, economics, market, uh, U.S. politics, and partner politics. It's, it's a 15 or 16 country program. I think it's going to take a long time to make sense of this, but it's worth doing. And the only clue I can suggest is that in the real world, in the biological world, evolution doesn't plan ahead. It just reacts to, to opportunities. We may have to keep that kind of thing in mind, and I'd like your thoughts on dealing with this incredibly important transition. Um, yeah, it brings to mind a couple of things. Um, when I was in the Shuttle Mir program, my deputy was Jim Van Lack, and Jim used to like to say our objective was to keep the bureaucracy at bay and get the <laughs> mission done. And, um, and I, I think that's what we have to do now, is to figure out how to, you have to have a bureaucracy of sorts, but it, it shouldn't be in your way, and it should enable what you're trying to do. So ideas people have that aren't necessarily technical, but might be either on the business side, or on the regulatory side, or on the paperwork side, that will enable this and, and shorten the process, uh, but also continue to make it reliable, because you can't afford to let things slip through the cracks that aren't gonna harm somebody. Um, I think it is very, very important. So we need innovation across the board, and we need people to be listening, but we also have to ha all have the same goal, which is to make it more cost effective, continue to keep it safe, and, and make it uh, more timely. And in a way, just like evolution, you may also have to let a few things fall by the wayside that aren't working. And one of the things I saw in the shuttle program was that when a PI spent years developing an experiment that they finally got approved to go on the shuttle, but they overlook some basic technical problem like you know backup power or what or sufficient strength to handle the launch loads or whatever that that just didn't work out. People and I don't want to say just NASA, but people would spend millions of dollars to try to make that payload work because it had ridden on the shuttle and gotten to space. Well, in the future we may just have to say it didn't work and you're going to have to go by the wayside. So that'll put the onus on the developers to make sure it really is going to work. But, but you almost have to be brutal in your, in your selection process, whether it occurs early or late. And I love that, that metaphor of, of, of evolution. You know, we, we want to have a framework that, that ensures this is going to be safe and that the things we're trying are heading us in the general direction of this vision of our industrial park in space. But the best way to get this stuff to happen is to jump in and start trying things. And as Frank said, some of them will work and some of them won't. And we shouldn't be afraid to move past the ones that don't. And we will discover the right way to build this model by doing it. Thank you. And many of you have heard this before, but uh, and Brian O'Connor was fond, fond of saying this when he was chief of safety for NASA. Was Whenever you get into discussion and something's not going to work yet, you still have to say, no, but if you do this, we can do it. Or yes, if you do this, we can move forward. So you've got to take that mindset into all of what we're doing here. Thanks, Frank. See another question out there? Yeah, uh, Frank Slazer, Aerospace Industries Association. Just, um, I'll, I'll give you another metaphor, which is uh, there's going to be a divide in the space community where there's a significant component that sees ISS as more of an impediment to funding rushing off to Mars as quickly as possible, establishing colonies or establishing long-term presence there. Uh, as soon as possible. It, it's almost like if the, if the British had established the Plymouth Colony and decided immediately they wanted to abandon it and go off to the, you know, the Pacific Northwest. Um, how do we bridge that gap in the community and help uh, 
help those that advocate more uh, beyond Earth exploration activities realize ISS is, uh, is part of that process. Well, you know, we have to see this as a, you know, as a sort of a stair-step kind of, of journey where we go out and we explore and we learn what uh, resources are there and how you live there. That's what NASA has been doing. Then we come in behind that with the settlers and we uh, develop the economic activities that go with that and then push again. So it's not one or the other. They have to be done together. And the infrastructure that we're going to create in LEO and eventually in Cislunar will be necessary to support what comes after the exploration to Mars. Or else we never get past flags and footsteps. Yeah, as Tori said, it is a journey and we have to look at it that way. And you have the explorers and you have the pioneers and the settlers. And, and we have to approach space the same way we did exploring the new world and, and settling it. And, and we have to have the courage to do that, but we also have to have a long-term vision on that. And we can't let setbacks stop us for sure. And we can't let the fact that it's taking a long time discourage us. Um, I, I really like to, to push on the fact that it's the next generation that's going to benefit from what we're doing now. They're the ones that are going to go to Mars. They're the ones that are going to spend a lot of time at, at the moon, if not on the moon. And, and the rest of us are going to be proud of what they're doing. But if we stop doing what we're doing, they're not going to have that opportunity. And so it's just like building new schools. We have to keep them coming, and we have to have new educational approaches in order to make sure that next generation has the tools they need. If we want to expand civilization into the solar system, then we've got to keep these tools working. And yeah. Space and Station is a part of that, but there are other things coming that we need to, to continue to support. So I love these metaphors. So yeah. you're Lewis and Clark. <laughs> I'm the railroad. He's the farmers. <laughs> I, know, <laughs> I know both of you guys have ideas and, and, and business concepts for that area beyond low Earth orbit in cislunar space for starters. Frank, I know Cygnus mm -hmm. may wind up out there someday. Could you describe a little bit about what's, what's sure. happening? Sure. We already work on a concept uh, in conjunction with NASA called Next Step of a uh, deep space habitat based on the Cygnus design. Um, I, I like the fact that a lot of people call it a, a Cygnus class vehicle stationed at the moon in Cislunar. Uh, we have one of those. Um, uh, but I think uh, having uh, a module that can go there ahead of the crew, be loaded with supplies, provide them with life support, backup power, maybe backup propulsion, uh, in conjunction with, with great upper stages like you're talking about, I think will enable and make safer the idea of going back to the moon and spending a good bit of time there. Uh, I think eventually whatever we do to commercialize station in terms of adding modules, adding new storefronts or, or new laboratories will move to that area too because it's going to be incredibly valuable and, and, uh, and new for, for researchers. So I think there's a model that you could follow out there. And, and the model of the uh, COTS and CRS contracts where you had a government, uh, a private public partnership to develop that where both sides are taking risks uh, will work to a certain extent in that environment too. Uh, it'll be a little slower evolving in terms of actual business case. Uh, but I think if you build it on those premises and use commercial practices to get there, then it can be affordable. And you'll have full involvement from, from industry who is also taking risks. Thank you. You know, there's um, sort of a, a divergence among the space station partners about where to go next. The, a lot of, of NASA's partners want to go back to the surface of the moon. And um, for a lot of reasons, including resource utilization, specifically water. And I know, to just push it way on out there, that your company has a concept for actually using those resources and, and buying them from somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the great discovery of our time that I, I think has gone without as much fanfare as it deserves is that water is everywhere. I mean, you know, those of us our age remember when we thought only the Earth had water. Now we know that water is every place, and that's important to us not just because, you know, people drink a lot of water, <laughs> but because it's rocket fuel. It will be one of the great enablers that allow us to be, you know, a multi-planet species because we will not have to bring the uh, essence of our chemical propulsion from the surface of the Earth out of this deep gravity well each time. 
And so I think we're discovering through research that it's relatively easy to capture water, we hope, from celestial bodies. It's, we know how to turn that into hydrogen and oxygen and make rocket fuel out of it. And our long-term vision, you know, it starts with us bringing extra propellant up when we have excess capability on a given boost and being able to store it for years at a time on orbit to refuel uh, ACES for additional lift missions. We're, we're not miners, we're not any of that other stuff. We're the transportation guys, but we hope to enable those businesses so that they'll buy more rockets. But eventually we will move to a point where we are recovering that propellant from bodies in space, from the moon where we believe there's an enormous quantity, from the near earth objects where we hope to see other people mining and exploiting the resources that are there in such abundance it defies imagination. I see we have some more questions out there. Yeah, I think it's a question that connects this idea of uh, creating a cis lunar economy with uh, the capabilities that um, Orbital ATK has right now and the capabilities that ULA is envisioning to set in place. So I've always wondered, uh, we have this tendency of deorbiting or burning stuff uh, sent back to, I mean, just, just uh, deorbit and burn. Um, and everything that's in space right now has a pretty high price tag um, and while maybe we haven't figured out what we could do with everything that's in there, I was wondering if you've um, looked into it or if somebody, somebody did a study on um, what is it that's there and how could it be repurposed, maybe stored for a while until we figure out what we do with it. What, what's, what's your thinking there? Well, I think that is certainly part of the vision to answer your question in broader terms, that stuff's only super expensive because we had to lift it from the surface of the earth to get it there. Uh, part of this vision behind uh, what we're going to be able to do with this very long duration upper stage is don't bring it back to the earth. Quit doing that. Leave it up there where it is potentially reused. And if not reused as a propulsion stage, perhaps someone might buy it from me and reuse the materials that are in it. Because over time, we're going to build infrastructure in LEO and in cis lunar space, because there's going to be people living and working there. They need a place to live, they need materials to fabricate from. So recycling in space will be so much more, even more attractive than it is here on Earth. Yeah, well, wh I think wh we where are we? Yeah. Where are we right now with it? Where are we with recycling? What's yeah, with in the space? thinking. I mean, is it, are, we, are we trying to actively um, change from uh, deorbiting these things to really finding active, proactive solutions towards recycling? We are, but there's practical questions associated with yeah. that. I mean, the, right now, most of the things that we're sending up that humans can use are going to the space station itself, and it's pretty full. As large as it is, they have to offload it, an equivalent amount of whatever cargo we carry up each time in order to have space to move and for the crew to live. Uh, so there's just not a way to practically recycle everything or to keep it on orbit. Uh, and so bringing it, unless you develop a reentry system such as SpaceX has, which does bring some things back to Earth, uh, particularly science-related uh, payloads, uh, it's just not practical at the moment. But I think someday, as we continue to increase activity in space, we will evolve to more and more recycling, just as we do mm -hmm. do down here. So everybody has that as a goal. And, and the things that Tori is talking about, of keeping things on orbit and combining them and, and whatever, um, I think is, is the way we will go in the future. So that people do see that as a goal. Thank you. So you're a visionary with that question. You're just a step ahead. We need yeah. to know a little bit about what we're going to do with it. It costs money to save stuff yeah. and to store it. Grandma's attic is not free. <laughs> <laughs> and so before we do that, we should have this framework in mind and, and save the right stuff. I see one more question out there, and I think we're running yeah. low on time. So, Mike Reed with the uh, Space Station Commercial Space Utilization Office. Um, Tori and Frank, both of you guys have mentioned that your vision for uh, commercial economy in LEO requires government as a significant tenant. I'm concerned that that's perhaps not consistent with what NASA is thinking. The taxpayers have already invested tens of billions of dollars in Space Station. And it's a, it's a very broad research platform, but it's not highly scalable in any one area. And so as these new firms, the Maiden Spaces, the Planet Labs, they test their technologies in a subsidized environment. 
then they need to migrate. And that's what we see as the role of, of a commercial module or a commercial free flyer. And I'm, I'm just, I'd like your comments on uh, that vision of a commercial economy as opposed to, um, to me, it's a recasting of a traditional government contractor role if the government has to be uh, a big tenant in what would be a quote-unquote commercial module. Well, so, go ahead, Frank. For the time being, I think that's just reality, uh, both for the, in terms of uh, the cost of doing business as well as what's available to do business with. Um, Tori and I are in the, basically the transportation and infrastructure business. You all are in the business of sending business uh, or sending uh, capabilities and, and research to space, and we will do as much of that as you can send our way. Uh, but we need everybody associated with this who wants to continue to build business in space to be really aggressive about it and find the investors, which are a big part of it also, people who are willing to invest in space for the long term. The, we're talking 10 or 15 year investments, and that's not a Wall Street standard in most cases. So you've got to, to everybody pull together and keep that vision going. And I've got a couple of closing comments if we're going to get to that point. Please. Um, this is really, really important in what I'm about to say, and I think people tend to forget it uh, because we talk to ourselves all the time. We come to these conferences, we have great conversations. Um, Hollywood helps us and hurts us in what we think reality is and what the public thinks reality is. I love all the space movies now, but they're not really where we are now, and I don't want the public to get the right idea, a wrong idea. It breaks my heart when I talk to somebody in high school or college or even a young adult who says, you know, it's really sad that NASA shut down. Mm -hmm. You know, and it just it just kills me because you're all here and we're, you know, we're still exploring space. But this is the foundation of human space exploration. But it has to be publicly supported. It has to be supported by all the governments that are involved in it so that industry can continue to afford to invest in it and be a part of it. We need you all to not just talk to each other. How many of your neighbors actually know you work in the space business? How many of your children's teachers know you work in the space business? And how many of you get out and talk to the kids about what their future could be in STEM? We have to keep spreading the word as a community one by one by one to people out there. I mean, people like Frank write great articles about what we're doing. And, and Eileen and Jeff and the others I've seen here, and they tell the world what's happening, but the world's not necessarily listening unless you get in their face and tell them, this is really important to you and your future. I know I'm out of time. I'm always out of time. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you've got to get out there and spread the word and tell people what you're doing. Give them tours of your facility. Bring them on site. Uh, bring classes to your workplace and show them what you're doing. Go to classrooms and talk to kids, answer their questions. But if we don't do that as a community, uh, we are going to be isolated and people aren't going to support us. So. What a great message. When you're doing that proselytizing, don't forget the politicians. This is an election year, and it's not just presidential. So Yeah, it'd be wonderful if we heard a space policy out of somebody. That's right. Tori, any last words? Yeah, you know, I just want to kind of build on, on what Frank said. That, that was such an important message, and it's hard for us to do that, you know, us rocket scientists. We're kind of shy. Don't be embarrassed. You know, I'm not sure I'm all that interesting a guy, but I know my job is pretty interesting. And so I spend a lot of time in the community, and that gives me the courage to say, you know, they're going to remember a kind of a cool experience of, of having a chance to meet somebody who's in the space industry and tell them about the exciting things that are right here within our grasp. You all can do that, too. Don't be embarrassed about it. Thank you.